الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى Who's been able to understand who you are, to fully appreciate 
your character, your noble traits is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously your creator, and myself. And the only one who fully understood me is Allah, my creator, and you. And so when Imam Ali speaks about the Prophet, he is one who has fully appreciated the character of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, and I quote in Najibala, طبيب دواب بطبه قد أحكم مراهمه وأحمى مواسمه. He says the messenger of Allah is a doctor, a physician who does not sit in an office to treat his patients. طبيب دواب بطبه. He's a physi physician that roams around, a roaming physician. What that means, brothers and sisters, is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this human being with deficiencies and weaknesses and issues that they have to deal with. And for those issues and for those deficiencies and weaknesses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided solutions and treatments. And for our bodies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created nature. He created chemical compounds. He created us as intelligent beings who are able to find the best treatments to treat these physical ailments. And for our spirits, He sends His Messenger. The Imam says that the Messenger of Allah is a physician who treats these spiritual ailments. But he does not sit around waiting for patients to approach him. Rather, he goes out seeking patients who need his help and his treatment. And he's not only a physician who treats spiritual ailments, but he does so for free. He does not seek any compensation in return. In one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In ajri illa ala Allah. I seek not any compensation from you. My compensation comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why people who seek to represent the Messenger of Allah, people who seek to speak on his behalf, people who assume the mimba, and people who assume the position of religious guides and spiritual leaders must follow the same character trait, the same example as the Messenger of Allah. Remember in Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells a very beautiful and elaborate story which I won't get into tonight. But he tells the story of a man who goes out trying to win support for the Messenger of Allah. A messenger that was sent to the Israelites. So this man goes out and he speaks about the, the, the qualities and the features of these messengers. And he says, Ask those and follow the example of those who do not ask you for any compensation. So the Messenger of Allah is one who seeks no compensation. The other verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands his Prophet to tell the people, I do not ask you for compensation or remuneration in exchange for my services. Let me tell you a story. One day the Messenger of Allah comes out of his house. Remember the house of the Messenger was adjacent to the mosque. They were door to door. So he comes out of his mosque. In other words, he does not use internal access from his own home to the mosque. Instead, he makes a public appearance so that people are able to uh, recognize the Prophet and appreciate what he has to say to them. He comes out of his house and he calls on to the people, Ayyuhannas! Oh people, I have a declaration. In today's terms, you can refer to this gesture as a press conference. Imagine if the President of the United States of America wanted to hold a press conference. The press would be all over the White House lawn trying to, to figure out what the, the President has to say. Everyone would want to know 
everyone would want to be the first to report on what the president has to say. If the prime minister of this country wanted to make a public statement, the press would be all over the place. So the messenger of Allah is throwing a press conference. He says, Ayyuhu nas O people, Inna Allah, listen, this is not a word from me, but rather it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God has verily prescribed a right for me upon you. Ja'ala li haqqan alaykum. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this messenger of yours has a right. Let me say something before I continue the hadith. One day, a man came to the Prophet and he provided some kind of a service. I can't remember exactly what it was. But say it was a renovation in his house or any kind of service that people would provide as professionals to others. So this man provides a service to the messenger. The messenger then says to him, so how much do I owe you now? He said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, you are a messenger. I'm never going to quote your price. After all the things you've done for us, after all the guidance you've provided us with, I'm not going to ask you to, to pay me anything. This is all on me, Ya Rasulullah. The messenger said to him, no. I'm your messenger, I'm your prophet. Whatever I've done for you, I've done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not so that you could give me a discount here, or you could provide me with a service there for free. Look at the messenger. And so, for the first time ever, the Prophet of God comes out, throws a press conference, and says that God has prescribed the right for me upon you. Are you going to fulfill this right? The hadith says, and I quote, listen, the hadith says, everybody stood still. Imagine if somebody's standing and you have a bird on your shoulder, right? Doesn't that ever happen to you? You go to the park or the zoo or what have you, and, and a bird out of the blue stands on your shoulder. You see how people stand absolutely still so that the bird doesn't fly off? That's how everybody stood. Making sure they don't even sneeze so that the messenger, you know, mis misunderstands that gesture as someone actually standing up and, and saying that they're volunteers, that they're going to give the Prophet what he wants. Imagine these were people who called themselves companions. What kind of a companion are you? What kind of a friend are you? The messenger says, I need something from you, and it's God who prescribed it. The hadith says, the Prophet went back home disappointed. No one even answered his question. What was his question? He said, Are you going to fulfill my right? No one answered him. He goes back home, the next day the Prophet comes back out again. There are lessons in this hadith, brothers and sisters, for all of us. He comes back out again in the same fashion, exits his house, goes out in the, into the street, and calls out, Are you going to fulfill this right of mine? No one said a word. The Prophet goes back home, disappointed again. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Imagine if you were there that day. What would you do? Wouldn't you say, Ya Rasulullah? Sure. Tell us. Just say the word. We're at your service. But not those people. The third day, the Prophet comes back out, makes the same proclamation. Eventually, when the Prophet realizes these people are not going to volunteer, they're not going to respond to him as he expects them to, eventually he adds a caveat. He adds a, a disclaimer, if you like. He says to them, Listen, I'm not going to ask you for money. The hadith says, Then the companion said, If that's the case, then shoot. Tell us what it is. What do you want from us? Allah Akbar. So the messenger says to them, he recites the, the verse from the Quran, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجَرًا إِلَّا الْمُعَنْدَةَ فِي الْقَرْضَىٰ Say that I do not seek any compensation from you, except that you, what? I'm not asking for, asking for any physical activity, I'm not asking you for any effort, any kind of energy. All 
asking you is to harbor in your heart the love of my project, the love of my close relatives, that's all. Now, back to the hadith of the commander of the faithful. The Imam says, Tabibun Dawarun Bitabbih. He goes out to find the patients, doesn't wait for them in the surgery. He provides services for free, does not expect anything in return. Listen to this. Ahkamamarahima means he's prepared his ointments. And ointment is something that's back in those days would be used to heal wounds, to provide, provide comfort over areas that experience pain. Mausim or Mesam is a blade that was used to cut a tumor, to cut out like a scalpel, right? So the Imam says that he had both methods employed, depending on the patient's conditions, depending on the disease that he was dealing with. On the one hand, if all it took to cure a spiritual disease was to provide an ointment, was to provide glad tidings, remember that's what the Prophet did. He was Bashir and he was Nadir. Bashir is one who provides glad tidings. Bashir is one who uses the moral conduct that the Prophet was so famous for to get people swayed towards the right path. Bashir and Nadir was one who warned, one who reminded people of the wrath of God, of the eternal damnation in the fires of hell, of burning in the inferno. And both these, these methods are very important. There are those who would tell you, you need to focus on one and not the other. Focus on inviting people to Islam through all these glad tidings. And through, well, that's very important. But on the other hand, there are those who simply aren't going to take heed when you simply tell them about the pleasures of paradise. Right? Sometimes, if you, if you sit down with someone and you're trying to convince them to wake up for Salat al-Subh, you can tell them all you want about the pleasures of paradise. But that's not going to get them out of their cozy, comfortable, warm beds. What will get some people out of their cozy, warm beds is if you tell them that if you don't wake up, you're going to burn it out. It works. It works. And Imam Ali says to Imam Hassan and Hussein in his last will and testament, he says, Say the truth. Always say the truth. Whether it be a joke or something more serious. Never lie, not even jokingly. Aqula bilhaq, wa'amala lil aj, and work for uh, receiving remuneration on the day of judgment. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes, Imam Ali is able to reach the levels where he worships God because he sees God as worthy of being worshipped. You and I, however, we have our own tendencies, and depending on your personality. You like tidings towards the, the character of the Prophet of being a Bashir, towards knowing that you're going to end up in paradise with the Holy Messenger of Allah. I'll give you an example. During the 30-day uh, the war in Lebanon, South Lebanon with Israel, they say that uh, there was a group of youths that got together in a cave or a shelter of some kind. And there was a Someone with them who was perhaps more learned, perhaps a sheikh, a sayyid, or something along those lines. And in order to provide these young, you know, men and women with some comfort, I don't know if you've ever experienced war, I have. I've experienced war twice. And it's, it's debilitating. It's scary. It's something that takes away the pleasure of life completely. I've seen shells coming down on, on, on homes and on cities, and it's, it's truly a shocking experience to go through. Charlie will never go through that. And so you can imagine these young men and women were in this shelter, and missiles are coming down, war planes are shooting. It's a very scary uh, place to be. So they say that this elder was telling these young men and women, um, you know, trying to provide them with some comfort, and one of the things he said to them was, listen, what's the worst that can happen? We'll probably end up dying here, but if we die, we're going to go straight to paradise. The tradition says that uh, on the night of Ashura, 
Buraya, who was one of the companions of Imam Hussein, you probably heard his name because he was one of, one of the people that Imam Hussein mentioned by name when he was asking for the, for the last time, he was asking for, for help before he went out into the battlefield on the last time. Ya Zuhair, Ya Buraya. This man was known to be a teacher of the Holy Quran in the holy city, in the city of Kufa. It is a holy city. It's going to be the capital of the savior of the awaited Imam. He's going to rule the universe uh, in, in, his, in his universal government of peace and justice from the city of Kufa. So Buraya was from Kufa and he was known to be a teacher of the Holy Quran. The Hadith said that on the night of Ashura, he began to crack a few jokes with his companions. So one of the companions of Imam Hussein, he looks at Buraya, the Hadith says that they spent that night It's like a camp of the companions of Imam Hussein had turned into a beehive. Have you seen wasps and bees and, and bees in their, in their hive? The, the kind of noise that they make? They were making a similar noise while praying and supplicating and reciting the Holy Quran. Beautiful atmosphere, spiritually charged. So the companion says to Buraya, he says to him, this is not the time to be cracking jokes, oh boy. Why do you, malaka wal batil? This is batil, this is vain talk, it's a waste of time. We got more important things to do. What I said to him, listen, I'm an old man. I've never been associated with batil, with vain speech. I've, as, a, as a young man, I, I was always a reciter of the Quran. As an old man, I was a teacher of the Holy Quran. However, the reason I'm so joyous, the reason I'm so happy now is because it's only a matter of a few hours before we feed the thirst of our swords with the blood of our enemy and end up in the laps of the damsels in paradise. So the, the, the elder that I've been talking about, while they were in the shelter, he's comforting these young people. And one of the things he said to them that the worst thing that can happen is that we're going to die and we will be embracing the angels in paradise. One of these young men said to him, he got up and he said to him, Sheikh, just answer this question. Stop talking about the, the bliss of paradise. You know, we don't need to know about the angels and the pleasures. Just tell me this, am I going to see the luminous face of my master Hussein or not? Because if I am going to, if I'm going to see him, then that's all I need. That's all the comfort I need right now. And so back to the hadith of the commander of the faithful. He says, and he uses these two methods. He uses them in accordance with the person with the person that he's dealing with. The messenger of Allah, I don't know where to begin to talk about him, his character, his morals, his conduct. But perhaps one of the most beautiful things about the messenger, and this is something that our young uh, audience members should know, and if we're going to do any kind of uh, propagation or preaching to non-Muslims, which we need to, brothers and sisters. We really need to go out there, as Sister Maria mentioned, our honorable sister who's come from Perth, she truly appreciates propagation and preaching. Now that she's been deprived of any kind of spiritual community, any kind of Muslim center or mosque in that, in that area, she understands She's come from that background, she's reverted to Islam from, from Christianity. And you and I need to realize that there's going to be uh, a day in which we're about to cross the Sirat. Tradition say Sirat is, it's not a bridge, it's not like the Harbor Bridge. It's a passageway, it's a pathway between the desert that houses the creatures of God on the Day of Judgment and Paradise. And underneath, there are the flames of the inferno. The hadith says that a believer is about to cross this pathway into paradise when a hand of fire extends from the inferno and grabs his ankles. The hadith says that the, the believer who's almost in paradise, you can imagine, he's about to enter, when suddenly this hand comes out and grabs your feet, he looks down and it's an acquaintance of him. It's a friend or a companion. <clears throat> or like I said, just an acquaintance, someone who happened to be with you one day. A co-worker, a colleague, a classmate, a teacher, someone you were with for a while, 
who's burning in hell and he's going to say, why didn't you guide me? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you read a verse from the Quran or tell me a little bit about your prophet or about your imam so that I would be guided today? We have a responsibility, brothers and sisters. And don't say I can't do it because I'm not qualified, because I'm not a shaykh, I'm not a saint. Anyone can preach. Let me give you this verse and then move on to the prophet. One day a person came to the messenger and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, tell me, what is your religion about? If you were asked that question, what would you say? It's a difficult question, you know what? Because you need to summarize everything you've known about this faith into a nutshell. And usually, summarizing large texts is very, very difficult. What is the nutshell? What is the, the, the core of this religion? So he says to the Prophet, listen carefully. What is your religion about? What are you here to preach? The Messenger says to him, Inna Allah Ya'lam. It's a verse in the Quran. God commands three things. Three injunctions and three prohibitions. Inna Allah Ya'lam bil adl wal ihsan wa itayin al qurba. God commands justice. Don't oppress anyone. Don't hurt anyone. Don't take anyone's possessions. Do not curse people. Do not be oppressive in any shape or form, be it as a person who holds a position of authority, or be it as one who is a member of a, of a nucleus family. Do not oppress anyone. In the law, ya'mur bil adl. What ihsan? Ihsan is the next step up from justice. Ihsan is doing good to people. Because sometimes justice is to take what, what belongs to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that's not enough. You need to practice ihsan. You need to give from what you own to others. If someone curses you, the just thing to do is to curse them back. But God says that's not enough. Do not curse them back. My father has a beautiful statement in which he says, avenge the wrongdoing of others towards you. You know if somebody hurts you? Avenge that by forgiving them. You need to forgive. In the law, ya'mur bil adl, number one. Wal ihsan, number two. Wa ita'i bil qurba. And to provide for your kindred, your family members, your relatives. Help them. Give them charity. I'm sure many of you, if not all, have relatives in, in third world countries who are probably not as well off as you are, who have difficulty providing for their families. Give them sadaqah. Through sadaqah, you win your own safety. Sadaqah is the, is, is, is the greatest divine insurance policy in existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides you and your family with safety and wellness by the mere fact that you give sadaqah to someone. And the hadith says, listen, لا صدقته You cannot give charity to someone if you have family members who are suffering. If you have family members and relatives who are disenfranchised and, and unable to provide for their families. In other words, the number one priority is your relatives and your family members. So, in the Allah ya'mur bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'i dhul qurba wa yanha an al fahsha'i wal munkari wal baghi. The three prohibitions al fahsha' to have a foul mouth. Something that a lot of us in the West are suffering from, unfortunately, because what happens is. Correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of people who come from Muslim countries and they settle in these Western countries, in these, you know, uh, uh, developed countries if you like. What happens is they lose, in the process of settling here and living here for a prolonged period of time, they lose the good uh, elements of their culture and they only retain the bad elements while they pick up only the bad elements of Western culture. There are a lot of things about Western culture that are nice, you know, things that are based on Judeo-Christian Judeo values, universal values of goodness and whatnot, right? These are good things. But what happens is, if we're not provided with the right education, we retain only the evil elements of our own culture and pick up the evil elements of Western culture. Foul mouth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits us from that. Al-Fahsha wal Baghi. Al-Munkar, excuse me, Al-Fahsha, Al-Munkar. Munkar is, 
engaging in uh, behavior that is not befitting to the status of a Muslim. It is engaging in sinful acts, getting involved in acts of transgression, right? So the first has to do with your conduct, the second has to do with your uh, deeds, and the third, wal-baqi, oppression. These, this is Islam in a nutshell. Now, the Messenger of Allah had a lot of great attributes that we could talk about. However, the greatest attribute of the Messenger of Allah is his akhlaq. The fact that he treated his enemy with such mesmerizing conduct that left no choice for his enemies but to embrace him. It's unbelievable how... You know, traditions say that the Messenger of Allah never killed anyone. Even though he was always... He engaged in, in roughly 80 battles. Right? And don't get me wrong, he was always at the forefront. But traditions say that he never physically killed anyone. Why? Because the, hadith, the verse in the Quran says that the Messenger of Allah was sent rahmatan as a mercy to mankind, not to kill people. Yes, people, certain individuals had to be physically eliminated. They had to be put down. They had to be killed. Like people like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab couldn't exactly sit down with the Messenger of Allah and be guided to the truth, even though the Messenger did that. He would spend countless hours with these individuals in order to guide them, but they wouldn't accept, and they were... Uh, performing acts of aggression against Muslims and so they had to be killed. But he himself never killed anyone. One story says that the messenger once went to rest. This was in the middle of the battle. He went to the side, perhaps on a hilltop nearby, to rest. So one of the enemy combatants, one of the soldiers on the enemy camp, realized that the messenger had taken a step to the side. So he says to his people, or he thinks to himself, I'm going to go and kill him and come back and surprise everyone. It's, a, it's an easy target. So the hadith said that he went out and he came right on top of the messenger who was lying down getting some rest. He took out his sword and he assumed the position. You can imagine someone's about to deal a lethal blow. He assumed the position, lifted the sword, the messenger opened his eyes. So the man says to the Prophet, he says to him, مَنِ الَّذِي يُلْقِذُكَ مِنِّي الْيَوْمِ يَا Muhammad, Oh, oh Muhammad, who's going to save you from me right now? Your God's going to save me? Your religion's going to save you? Your religion's going to save you? Who's going to save you from me now? So the messenger is absolutely calm and collected. The hadith says he looked at him and he said, Allah, God is going to save me. So the man realizes that the enemy combatant realizes that this is not a conversation that's going to end uh, in anybody getting convinced of each other's position. So he decides to deal the, the lethal blow when all of a sudden he trips over a rock that he was standing on, falls to the ground. The messenger jumps out in a very swift move, grabs his sword, stands on top of him in the same way that he had stood on top of the Prophet just a few seconds earlier. The Prophet then says to him, Who's going to save you from me now? So the man says to the Prophet, Rahmatuka, Ya Muhammad, your mercy. That's the only thing I have to rest on right now. So the Prophet throws his sword to the ground. He says to him, Go back to your people. Had it been anyone else, you'd want to take revenge from the one who was about to kill you. This is the Messenger of Allah. In fact, the hadith says, quotes the Prophet, Rabbi. Listen to this. My God, my Lord, disciplined me. And he provided a very proper, a very efficient kind of discipline for me. I am disciplined by God Himself. And it's only after being disciplined by God, only after acquiring all these beautiful traits, of mercy, compassion, to the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him, لَعَلَّكَ in Surah Al-Shu'ara, look up Surah Al-Shu'ara, verse number three or number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ أَلَّا يَكُونُ مُؤْمِنِينَ بَاخِعُ means to kill. God says, it's a verse of the Quran, God says, you're about to kill yourself so that you die these people. 
But they're not going to find guidance. They're not going to find the truth. He's about to kill himself for them. Get himself killed. So, uh, the messenger says in the hadith, he says that God provided me with such discipline that he then said, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ رَبِيٍ Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the Prophet had great morals. The great God is saying that he had great morals. Imagine if I, if I said to someone here that you had, you had great knowledge, for instance. You know, this statement of mine doesn't carry a lot of weight because who am I to say that someone else has great knowledge? But if Einstein had said to someone, you have great knowledge, or Stephen Hawking said to someone, you have great knowledge. Or some other Nobel laureate says to someone, you have great knowledge. Now that's a great statement. So it's not you or I, brothers and sisters, who are saying this about the messenger. It's not some orientalist. It's not some author. It's not some Western academic. Even though we use these quote, quotes to uh, praise the Prophet of Islam, only to introduce the messenger to Western culture. But to us, it's not important. I've said this all along. For us to quote Gandhi, for instance, and say that Gandhi said, I wish to be like Hussein, to be oppressed, what, to, be, to, be, to achieve victory while being oppressed, such a statement, even if it's true, holds no value for us. We should introduce Muhammad Hussein on his own merit. We should introduce Imam Hussein to the, to the Western world using Imam Hussein's positions, Imam Hussein's words, Imam Hussein's expressions. We don't Imam need Charles or Gandhi or anybody else for that matter. When it comes to the Prophet of God, we don't need anybody else. Except maybe to introduce him to, to someone who doesn't know the Prophet, maybe. But here it's God Himself, the great Lord of the universe, who says to the Prophet that you have great morals. Now, this is one element, and there are many, many stories that we can mention. Last night, in the message, I mentioned this story, and I'll mention it here as well. Someone from the tribe of Beni Aslam. Beni Aslam were treacherous people. They were savages. And, you know, they were Bedouins living in the, in the desert, and so they weren't very civilized. One of them says that I'm going to kill this messenger. He goes into the city of Medina, by a fluke of chance, the first person he gets to meet is the messenger himself, but he doesn't recognize him. So the Prophet sees this young man who's come from the desert. He looks tired. He looks exhausted. He says to him, Ya Akhar Arab, Oh, Arab brother of mine, look at the way he treats people. He says, Ya Akhar Arab, what are you here for? What's your business? He says, I'm here to kill Muhammad. Imagine, somebody says that right to your face. I am here to kill you. The messenger didn't say who he was. He didn't call out for help. He didn't get his companions to come out. What he said to him was nothing short of astonishing. He said to him, you look tired. You look exhausted. Why don't you come to my house? I'm going to provide you with some food, a place for you to rest, and then you could go and do whatever it is you're here to do. So the man says, sure. He goes to the prophet's house. The messenger provides him with food, he gives him something to drink, and then he brings a mattress and a pillow, provides, you know, makes, makes a bed for this man, says that he wanted to rest for a while. So up to this point, you might be thinking, well, the messenger has these impeccable morals, and so for him to invite this old man, and this, this man who's about to assassinate the prophet into his home, might be a way for him to convince him not to do so, right? Wrong. Suddenly the hadith says the Prophet, uh, the, this man from Banu Aslam opened his eyes. He was resting, remember? He opens his eyes and he realizes the Prophet is standing by the window holding his cloak, his abaa, and blocking the sun's rays so as not to touch this individual who's resting. Now this is not a man who's trying to manipulate his enemy. This is not a man who's trying to convince him not to kill him or anything like that. He's doing this out of sheer love. Rahmatul Alameen was instead, except after the Prophet demonstrated his love towards human beings. And by the way, Lil Alameen is sometimes mistranslated as to all mankind. But that's not the correct translation. Lil Alameen means to all creations. 
prophet was a mercy to all creation. So the man opens his eyes, he says to him, what are you doing? He said, nothing, I'm just blocking the sun's rays because I realized it's hot and I didn't want the sun to, to burn your skin. So he wakes up, he thanks him. Then the prophet gives him some more food and drink for him to take with him on his way. And then he says to him, so what are you here for again? He said, I'm here to kill Muhammad, I told you. He said, well, if that's the case, you're going to have to kill me because I am Muhammad. The hadith says that man embraced Islam right there and then. قال أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله. This is again, like I said, there are many, many narrations, many hadith, many stories of the Prophet's impeccable morals. One story says, I mean, what we could do. And what I wish we could do is for us to, to publish little booklets, each one dealing with a, with a different facet of a prophet's life, with a different aspect or, or a different dimension, if you like. For instance, the prophet's treatment of his enemies. I think that itself needs an entire book dedicated to it. And just to give out, to, to, you know, give out that book and booklet to, to non-Muslims. Or an entire book about how the prophet treated women. Women who were... Uh, who were basically the lowest ranked members of society in those days. Women who were treated like worse than animals. Girls were being buried alive for crying out loud. You can imagine the status of women in those uh, pre-Islamic pagan societies where girls would be put to death by being buried alive. Right? The way he treated them, the way he spoke about them. For instance, uh, the commander of the faithful says, O Sani Rasulullah. Usually, when someone is about to die, the last words they utter sum up their philosophy of life. We all know that. And yet, the Prophet dedicates the last few moments of his life to talk about the things that really matter to him. And one of those things is how to treat women. <laughs> he called them qawariyam. Qarura is like a, a glass vase, a glass vessel. And it's a... It's a uh, it's a way to describe women as being delicate and worthy of being treated nicely and with compassion and love. Like a flower, as the commander of the faithful says. Al-Ma'at A woman is like a flower, like a rose. She's, not, she's different from a man who might be best described as a, as a, a piece of, uh, I don't know, iron rod that you, know, you could throw around, but a woman, she's different. And so the Imam says that the Prophet Awsani bin Mara'a, Awsani bin Nisa, he left instructions for me about women, so much so that I thought he was going to leave all his inheritance to women. In other words, he's treating them like his own children. The fact that he says in one hadith, and I've said this before and I think it's important, we can never overemphasize this. Because there are domestic violence problems that societies all over the world suffer from. There are issues with, with women being mistreated. The Messenger of Allah says that if a man extends his hand to slap his wife, God will command, I don't think you've heard this hadith, God will command the custodian of the fires of hell, Manik, his name is, he will command him to slap him 40 times with a fist of fire. That's how the Prophet exalted the position of women in society, having been treated like garbage in pagan uh, societies uh, prior to, to the revelation of the message. His treatment of children. One hadith, again I'm just giving you little snapshots here. One hadith says that one day they brought a, a, an infant, a baby to the Prophet. He was wrapped with a cloth, they gave him to the Prophet so that the Prophet would recite the Adhan in his right ear and the Adhan in his left ear. When the Prophet, while he was doing that, suddenly the baby urinated. They didn't have nappies or diapers back then. So the urine basically covered the, the Prophet's clothes. The family of the child rushed to grab the child and they began to scream at the little baby. How could you do this? How dare you embarrass us with the Prophet? The Prophet called him down, he said, stop, stop, don't scream at this little baby. He said, this, this clothes, this shirt of mine can be washed 
But the psychological damage, my words, not the prophets, he said, the damage you've caused to the personality of this little baby by screaming at him like that, you can't wash that away. His treatment of animals, like I said, I'm just opening headlines here. His treatment of animals, and again, is unbelievable, absolutely amazing. One hadith says that the Prophet was one day sitting down with, with his companions, you know, teaching them the Quran and whatnot, giving them instructions. When a, a cat came and sat on a part of the Prophet's cloak, the cloak had spread on the ground, a cat came and slept on the Prophet's cloak. The Prophet finished his, uh, his session with his companions, looked at this cat, didn't even wake the cat up. He tore his cloak up, left the cat sleeping comfortably on his cloak, and went back home. I mean, you know, it's the 21st century, brothers and sisters, and we have no such examples today. That's why this world needs the prophet. That's why you and I need to go out there and preach his message and tell the people about his impeccable, beautiful, mesmerizing morals and conduct. One day the prophet, so this is animals, his treatment of plants. It's amazing. The prophet used to lean on a tree to give his sermons while he was uh, in the early stages of building Masjid al-Rasul, the holy mosque in the city of Medina. So in the early days, they didn't have a pulpit. The prophet would lean on a tree and, and give his sermons. The hadith says that one day he first built the pulpit of the messenger, the Prophet went on the pulpit and delivered his sermon. Halfway through the pulpit, uh, the sermon, the Prophet comes back off the pulpit, approaches the tree, hugs it. Have you heard this expression when they talk about extremist environmentalists? They call them tree huggers. The Prophet was literally a tree hugger. He hugged the tree and then he said to the companions, he said, this tree is crying because I'm no longer leaning on it. And so I'm, I'm giving it comfort, like, like you do with a child. This is the messenger of Allah. We can take examples from this. Now what I want to do in the last few moments of my talk, I don't know if we're going to have a Q&A or not. I, I've been told that we are, inshallah. But before I finish and move on to the Q&A, uh, I'd just, I just like to mention a hadith. Uh, the hadith states that one day a man comes to the Prophet, he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, O oh, oh, Messenger of God, give me a, a word of advice. Now, as a speaker, let me share something with you. As a speaker, you would like to go to uh, a, you know, a mosque or a center and address a gathering that is quite substantial. If, you were God, if, if someone who didn't have the religion of Islam and the service to God in their minds, you would ideally want to choose, if you had the option of choosing between two centers, one with a very small crowd and the other with a bigger crowd, you would choose the one with the bigger crowd, obviously, right? Not the messenger and not the Ahlul Bayt and not anyone who associates themselves with the Ahlul Bayt. A person comes to the Prophet, the messenger of God, who was not only a messenger of God and the last of God's messengers, but he was the head of state, remember? He was the head of a vastly enormous kingdom, united only under his rule. And yet, when someone approached him, asked him for a word of advice, he wouldn't tell him, all right, come to my lecture on Thursday nights, inshallah, here's the address, I'll text it to you, then I'll talk. No. He gives him his full, undivided attention. Like the commander of the faithful. In fact, the Ahlul Bayt, I'll say something here as well. The Ahlul Bayt dedicated a, a huge portion of their times and their energies to addressing single individuals as opposed to large crowds. Why would they do that? In order to guide, if you can guide one person, that's all it takes sometimes. If this one person was to become a disciple, was to become a, a good example, you've done your job. You've created a copy of yourself. And that's why the other day would dedicate a, a, a huge amount of their time with these individuals that they would guide and they would train, they would treat them as though they are their protégés. Like Imam al-Sadiq and Hisham ibn al-Hakam. Imam al-Sadiq would welcome Hisham ibn al-Hakam, who many of you might know, was not a follower of the Ahlul 
great in the beginning. How he turned into one of the most outspoken and one of the most powerful debaters in service of the Ahlul Bayt, I don't know, except to say that the Ahlul Bayt took really good care of him. They taught him, right? They really taught him. They didn't just address him in a, you know, a monologue fashion. To the point that Imam Sadat would welcome Hisham ibn Hakam by means of standing up. When Hisham ibn Hakam walks in, Imam Sadat would stand up and say, Ahlam bin Asarina Ahlul Bayt. Welcome to our supporter. Supporter of the Ahlul Bayt, Hisham ibn Hakam. Even though he was really young. He was about 18, 19 years old. Harun al-Rashid, the father of Mahmoud, the father of Amin, says to one of his companions, he said, Inna lisana Hisham ibn Hakam la ashaddu al nas min alf sayf. He says, the tongue of Hisham is more powerful than a thousand swords. In other words, we have a, a, a lot of military firepower. Imam Salah only has Hisham ibn Hakam and we have failed. So this man, back to the hadith, he says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, oh son, you give me a word of advice. Listen to what the Prophet tells him. And again, there are lessons in, in, this, in these words of the Prophet for all of us. The Prophet said to him, number one, أَكْفَرْ مِنْ ذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ Remember death. In fact, I'll give you an exercise for you to try. Tomorrow when you wake up for Salat al fajr before you say Allahu Akbar, spend 10 seconds picturing yourself lying in your grave. You'll see what an impact that has on your soul. 10 seconds is all it takes. Just picture yourself. You lying in your grave, and people throwing dirt on top of you. It's unbelievable. The Prophet says, أَكْفَرْ مَنْ ذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ فَإِنَّهُ يُسِلُّكَ مَا الدُّنْيَا Sel is to extract something from something else. He says, remembering death extracts you and purifies you from this world. It, may, it puts everything into perspective. It makes everything that is worthwhile seem a lot more important than anything that's not worthwhile seem absolutely insignificant. Do you know why we're always thinking about fast cars and big homes and all these kinds of pleasures? These things that consumer society has created for us? Because we see them everywhere. If we think of them because we see them. If we were to go to cemeteries and graveyards a little more often, brothers and sisters, our lives would be a lot more productive. They'd be a lot more fruitful. That's why scholars say, or rather the hadith says that when you pray, salli salata muwadda. When you pray, think of this salah as your last act of worship. Suddenly this act of worship becomes a lot more concentrated. Suddenly you can't be distracted. Suddenly you're not thinking about your school homework or your you know, mortgage or your job or the economy. Everything is put into the right perspective. So the Prophet says, Number one instruction. Number two, he says to him, And pray, supplicate. Brothers and sisters, they say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember the verse in which Allah talks to Prophet Musa salam, what does he say to him? He says to him, Ya Musa, ma tilka bi yaminik. O Musa, what's this in your right hand? What was in Musa's right hand? It was his cane, right? The verse says, instead of Musa simply saying that it's my cane, he gets into, he gets into this conversation. He, he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's my cane, I lean on it, sometimes I use it when I'm you know, I, I, he was a shepherd, so I use it to, to uh, direct the, the sheep in the right direction, and I've got other uses for it. He gets into this very long monologue, telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what this is. God doesn't know what this is? Yes, he does. But some say the reason Musa speaks perhaps a little excessively in response to this question is because he's found an excuse to address God. He's found an excuse for the first time to speak directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You and I should find excuses to address Allah. And the beautiful nature of God is such that He has allowed us to address Him directly anytime, anywhere. Even He says to Musa in one hadith, Musa says to Allah that I 
there are places and times where I exalt you from my remembrance of you. There are times that you feel it's not appropriate to, to mention God. Like when you know what the Bible says to He says to him, remember me even when you're there. Mention. That's why it's actually mustahab when you go to the bathroom to say Bismillah wa billah wa fi sabilillah in the name of God. Essentially what's happening is a very primal need is being met. Excretion is coming out of our body. Waste is coming out of our body. That's what it is. And yet God says, remember me even there. He's giving us all these chances to address Him, to talk to Him. Look at the other day. Look at Amir al-Mumini. Imam Ali has dua salah for when you wake up in the morning. Beautiful dua. Unbelievably mesmerizing dua. Recite it as often as you can. Put it on your MP3 player. Put it in your car when you're going to work. Recite it every morning. Whenever you have a chance. He also has munajat. He has du'as for the nights of the month of Ramadan. He's got du'as for practically every occasion. Imam Zayn al-Abidin, read the book of du'as by Imam Zayn al-Abidin. As-Sahif al sajjadiyya It's called the Psalms of Al-Muhammad, the Psalms of the Ahlul Bayt. And it's a lot more beautiful than the Psalms. No offense or disrespect. But read the Psalms in the Bible and read the book of du'as by Imam Zayn al-Abidin. Munajat, for instance. These whispers, absolutely beautiful. And there is one for practically every occasion. There's one if you want to have children. There's one for the morning, one for the night, one for makarab al-akhlaq. Read these. It's shameful for a Shia, for, for a follower of Imam al-Abidin not to have opened a sahif al sajjadi So the Prophet says to this man, he says to him, Akfil min al-du'a. The third instruction, he says, beware of cunning deceptions. And I'll conclude with this. Cunning deceptions, plots. You know how sometimes people hurt you? You know, whether it be at school, at work, with their family. The natural reaction that we develop is always, how do I get back at them? Right? When you start thinking along that route, what happens is you start to plot. And you start to think, how do I hurt them the way they hurt me? Usually it's a very exaggerated sense of what actually happened. And so you begin to scheme and to plot, but remember this. This is a dangerous mindset. It's a dangerous way to treat things. Because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَحِيقُ الْمَقْرُ Remember this verse? إِلَّا بِأَهْلِهِ The problem with scheming, with evil plots, is that they always backfire. Like the ancient Chinese saying, I think, that says if you're going on the path of revenge, dig two graves. It always backfires. You always suffer the consequences of trying to get back at someone who hurt you in the first place. Never do that. Look at the, look at the people who tried to hurt the Ahlul Bayt, who tried to hurt the prophets, the messengers of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you are going to scheme, I'm the best schemers. I'm the best of all schemers. I scheme and I plot much better than you ever will. Pharaoh schemes to kill every newborn child. What happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a scheme is a lot more elaborate. It's like a movie plot. It's so beautiful, you have to have films made about it. He kills 40,000 infants, often ripping a woman's belly in order to kill her unborn fetus. That's what Pharaoh did. 40,000! And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa makaru, wa makaru Allah. He makes this child that Pharaoh kills 40,000 in order to kill, in order to get to, he grows up in the house of Pharaoh. Yazid tries, tries to kill Imam al-Hussein. He schemes and he plots. What happens? Imam al-Hussein's name is ever so exuberant. Imam al-Hussein's name is ever so lofty today. Where is Yazid? Where is Yazid? Where is Muawiyah? By the way, no one knows where Yazid's grave is. I have no idea. And I lived in Syria for a long time. But Muawiyah's grave? We managed to send a film crew I don't know if I've mentioned this before. We managed to send a film crew to try and track down the grave of Muawiyah. The way they did it, I didn't really approve of, but that's how it worked. 
The producer of the show went out, and he was from Lebanon, he's Lebanese, so he's not Syrian. He came and he told the people in the neighborhood, because they're very secretive about Muawiyah's grave. By the way, do you know why they're very secretive about it? Because people used to go there and urinate and throw all kinds of different garbage on it. So it was a, it was a bit of a drag, right? They didn't want to clean up after every single person who comes to visit his grave. So they shut it down and they don't allow anyone to visit him. Our producer went out and said, I'm a Christian. So I'm not a Sunni nor Shia, I'm Christian. And I'm from Junior or something from, from Beirut. And I'm here to film a documentary about the greatest Arab leaders. Through that lie, essentially what it was, like I said, I didn't approve of it, but through that they were able to track down his grave, and they found it, and we have exclusive footage of what it actually looks like. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, you see that grave, and you remember all the traditions about people being burnt in their graves. It's so depressing. Even though there's like a tiny little dome on top of it, but it's depressing. And I think it's nothing but that, the, the how do I say this? It's the echoes of Muawiyah's screams in his grave that is reflected on our personality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of, uh, of schemers. I'll conclude the hadith of the Messenger of Allah. He says to this man, do not scheme. Do not make evil plots to get back at people, even if you believe and you feel that you've been wronged. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to guide us to the straight path and to show us the beauty of the Messenger of Allah in the hereafter and to raise us with him and in his position. I'll conclude with these words. I think it's only appropriate. The Messenger of Allah, as he was lying on his deathbed, the Prophet was poisoned to death. Did you know that? Even Sunnis acknowledge that. The Prophet was poisoned to death, so we know the fact that he was murdered, and we all agree. We also know the means with which he was murdered. The Prophet was poisoned. The only difference between the various Islamic denominations and Islamic sects is that Sunnis claim he died as a result of being administered poison by a Jewish woman by the name of Zainab bin Talhalif, in the Battle of Khaybar. But the problem with this scenario is that the Battle of Khaybar took place four years prior to the Prophet's death. There's not a single poison that I know of that can remain dormant in a person's body for four years without any adverse side effects, without showing any kind of ailment, except in the last four days of the Prophet's life. So clearly he was poisoned. The only question is, who poisoned? Who had a vested interest in killing the Prophet? Who was it that abandoned the army that the Prophet commanded to go? Who was it that decided to stay back and prevent the Prophet from writing his last will and testament? These are questions for you to think about and for you to investigate. However, when the Prophet was on his deathbed, he brings Imam Ali close to him. He says to him, Ya Ali, I have one last wish, one last will for you to execute. What is it, Ya Rasulullah? He takes the hand of his daughter Fatima, places it in the hands of Ali, and says these words. He says to him, Ya Ali, Yeah.
killed between the wall and the door, causing his daughter Fatima to appeal to her father. She called out, Abataya, Ya Rasul Allah, O oh Father, O oh Messenger of Allah,
So clearly he was poisoned. The only question is, who poisoned him? Who had a vested interest in killing the Prophet? Who was it that abandoned the army that the Prophet commanded to go? Who was it that decided to stay back and prevent the Prophet from writing his last will and testament? These are questions for you to think about and for you to investigate. However, when the Prophet was on his deathbed, he brings Imam Ali close to him. He says to him, Ya Ali, I have one last wish, one last will for you to execute. What is it, Ya Rasulullah? He takes the hand of his daughter Fatima, places it in the hands of Ali, and says these words. He says to him, Ya Ali, هذه الوديعة احفظها فإنها أمانة الله ورسوله. Oh Ali. Trust of the Almighty Allah and His Messenger. Take good care of her, O Ali. Then I ask you, O Muslims, why is it that on a day like today, only a day after the after the death of the Messenger, the Prophet's own grandson, Muhsin ibn Ali, is <laughs> Why is the Prophet's unborn grandson is killed between the wall and the door, causing his daughter Fatima to appeal to her father? She called out, Abata! My God, they have killed my fetus, my child, Muhsin, that the Prophet himself had named. Now here's a question, O oh believers, O oh lovers of Fatima. Ali ibn Abi Talib was inside the house. Why didn't Fatima call on her own husband? Why didn't she call on? Why didn't she call on her maid, Zilla? Because Fatima didn't want Ali to the nail that had penetrated her belly. She didn't want to see to have Ali see her broken rib. Muhammad والمسقطين لها أعز جنيني اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 The Hadith says that anyone who calls out يا الله ten times will hear God's response, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond by saying, لَبَّيْكَ عَبْدِي Ask me for anything that you wish. Ya Allah, عَجِّلْ لِوَلِيِّكَ الْفَرَجْ وَالْعَافِيَةَ وَالنَّاسِ Allahumma ج'alna min ashabi wa'awanik wa shi'atihi wa muhabbih wa al-dhaabin anhu al-muhtathirin li'awamirihi wa nawaqih Let us all recite this dua for the hastening of the reappearance of our 12th Imam, insha'Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
اللهم كل لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة تمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد واله الطاهرين. اللهم صل على محمد
people's good nature, uh, you wouldn't be able to achieve desirable results. That's why you, you have to have the criminal justice system, you have to have uh, you know, the police forces, and you have to have armies, and you have to have uh, both merit and demerit uh, approaches to dealing with citizens. And I think God uh, has created both uh, aspects and has tapped into both uh, facets of our personality by creating heaven and hell. By having paradise on the one hand, appealing to us uh, as the ultimate means of freedom from all kinds of uh, pain and suffering, uh, the, the one thing that represents uh, the perfect utopian world, and on the other having the fear of the fires of hell, the fear of punishment, the fear of rejection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, I would say that based on the evidence available, it would have to be a perfect balance between the two. Um, when, when it comes to, perhaps, I mean, you talked about different individuals uh, being receptive to different uh, uh, stimuli. I think that might be the case um, sometimes. Uh, for instance, when it comes to small children, uh, I don't think it's appropriate for, for us to uh, threaten them and warn them about the fires of hell because it, it might be um, uh, traumatic for them, it might be difficult for them to digest as to why uh, there is any kind of punishment at all. Uh, but I think for, for a mature adult human being, whether it be a man or a woman, you'd have to have both, both elements um, emphasized. Ah, yes, go ahead. Come back to yourself. Salaam alaikum, Yashir. My English is not good, but I want to transfer my message to all the Shia's brothers and sisters. Tonight, before in Quetta, Pakistan, there is a big community Shia killed by Wahhabi. And uh, there is 120 people shahid and 160 injured. They are in the hospital and they are protesting uh, with the Shahada. They do not uh, uh, bury them. They are in the road. Uh, we just request uh, uh, you and the community of this uh, mosque to need to protest and, uh, and uh, pray for them. We need to protest. To, uh, to we, we are with them and uh, just. Uh, yes. Salam. Uh, you remember the hadith, the brothers and sisters, Man asfaha wa lam yaktab bi umur al-Muslimin, fa laysa bi Muslim. One who wakes up in the morning not concerned uh, about the affairs of other Muslims is not a Muslim. You can imagine all your beliefs, all your actions, all the good things that you've done will count for nothing if you wake up not being concerned, at least to show sympathy and empathy and concern towards those who are oppressed. And this latest massacre is a is a, a, only a, a small part in a long chain of um, repression that the followers of the Abu Bayt have been subjected to in Pakistan. Uh, I, for one, think that uh, protests may take a, a many different forms and shapes, but one of the things we could all do is to write to our local federal MP and to ask them what they're doing to prevent such massacres from taking place. Um, whether they're going to pressure the Pakistani government to take more action or um, uh, basically to put them on the spot. I think that's a very, very simple step you can all take. You don't have to go out and protest in the street. If you can't do that, that's fine. Write to your local MP. It's a very civilized and simple and uh, 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 easy way of, of showing your, uh, you know, protesting and show, expressing your dissatisfaction with what's happening. It, it is heart wrenching. It is. Uh, very difficult for us to receive th this news. I, I heard about it before I came here. 120 people murdered is not a small figure, brothers and sisters. 24 children, as tragic as that was, um, were killed in America and the entire world was talking about them. Here we have 120 people killed and their, their bodies were left on the street, apparently. Uh, I don't have the details of the incident, but apparently all these bodies were thrown on the street and left there for about a day or so. Uh, many, many more injured. It's, it's truly uh, uh, shocking, and uh, so we need to take some action. And the least you could do is to write your MP and to pray, inshallah, for their uh, safety. So, so. Yes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Brother, 
Every year when the month of Muharram comes, we beat our chest for Imam Hussein. Why do we beat our chest for Imam Hussein? Beating of the chest is like crying and using the chains to beat your back and any other form of uh, expression that deals with the, uh, the tragic aspect of Imam Hussein's martyrdom on Ashura. It's simply a means of expressing uh, the, the tragedy and the tribulation. Uh, I think if you, if you want to uh, explore the roots of this practice, you would have to go and look into how people uh, express their grief in Arab nations, and that's probably where it all came from. In Arabic societies, men, women, and people who experience a great tragedy, uh, they lose their child, they lose their close family member, their loved one, they do two things. They, they, they perform what we refer to as shakbul jay, where they tear their clothes apart, and they beat their chest and they beat their thighs, right? So they beat themselves in order to empathize, right? So that's the concept. It's to empathize, meaning to place yourself in the position of the one who is suffering. And so we suffer when we beat our chest, we experience a slight amount of pain. It's not a huge amount of pain, it's very small, uh, relatively speaking, in order to remind ourselves of the suffering of Imam Hussein. And ultimately, scholars say that doing so is not only uh, permissible, but highly recommended. Because any form of expression of grief, if it's for Imam Hussein, if it's for anybody else, you're not allowed to do it. If, God forbid, your father passes away, your mother passes away, you're not allowed to beat yourself. You're allowed to express your grief by crying, but beating yourself is called jaza. But jaza, in the case of Ahlul Bayt, in the case of Imam Hussein specifically, it's not only permissible, but highly recommended. Because what you're doing essentially, it goes back to the verse of the Quran, <laughs> You are glorifying the signs of God. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He who uh, glorifies the signs of God, this is a sign of the piety that exists in the heart. He's not saying those who uphold the signs of God. Upholding the signs of the sign of God, in the case of Imam Hussein, would be to throw a conference about him, for instance, to talk about him. God isn't saying that. He's saying those who glorify, those who amplify the signs of God. And so beating your chest is just one form of doing so. Do so, I have any more questions from the sister side? No takers? Let's go ahead. Just extending on that question that you asked. Your mic's not working. Just extending on his question that he asked earlier. Um, I saw some videos that actually over to the extent where they had swords, uh, sort of hitting the sides of the swords, where their back would literally split open, and then they were sort of obviously, you know, um, recommend sort of, you know, some sort of stitching. It looks like literally a lot of blood coming out. So, is that what are your views, or what would you say? My views on this, my views are completely irrelevant, unless you follow me as your manager. In which case you have to pay me your horse. <laughs> I am not. I'm not a manja. What you need to do when it comes to these things, which might be perhaps in the gray area, as far as uh, you know, the general, uh, the vast majority of people are concerned, you need to refer to your own manja. Um, most maraja allow this practice so long that it doesn't cause permanent harm and the loss of limb. So if it's just a matter of bleeding for a while and then uh, you know the wounds healing uh, on their own, uh, then that's okay, according to most Mahajan. But there are those who do not allow the practice, and ultimately it goes back to who you follow as your manja. It's not a it's not a, a means of us getting into any kind of fight. It's not about you know us disagreeing because ultimately it's a practice that uh, you know you refer to your own manja and whether or not he allows it or not. Uh, I have seen that practice, and it's, uh, you know, in Karbala, for instance, on the day of Ashura, uh, there are over 50,000, some people say up to 100,000, 100,000 individuals who are striking uh, their heads with the sword. Um, uh, apparently, uh, you know, obviously all of these people follow Maraja who allow this practice. So, as I said, you go back to your Maraja and see what he says. Um, just 
on the beating of the chest topic. As I was growing up, I was always told that or informed that um, wherever you beat your chest on your body, the day you die, that part of the material. Could you correct me? Could you correct that a bit? It doesn't deteriorate after yeah. burial medicine? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, there, there, there is anecdotal uh, evidence uh, or suggestions made that uh, uh, people who are non-Muslim and they beat their chests, uh, they're not going to have that portion of their body uh, which experienced this pain for Imam Hussein, uh, it's not going to burn, or something along those lines. But not necessarily. I think ultimately, um, it is the spirit that is, um, uh, you know, designed in order to live for eternity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our spirits not to die. And the body, at some point, will deteriorate unless you have performed an action which specifically uh, allows the body to, to remain intact. And tradition tells, for instance, that if you perform Muslim Jum'ah every Friday for 40 weeks, which is close to about a year, then your body is not going to uh, deteriorate or rot in the grave. So that's one thing we have a tradition about. But whether or not the, the portion that you beat, you know, I don't know, when you perform Aza is going to deteriorate, I, I, don't, I haven't seen any evidence, um, but I, I don't think that's necessary to, to, uh, to uh, uh, highlight the importance of the, of the practice of beating your chest. The practice of doing Aza, as I said, is, you know, so the scholars of Islam, the scholars of Shia Islam, are in complete agreement, they're unanimously in agreement about the fact that there are highly recommended, any form of grief expressed for Imam Hussein is, is recommended, unless, as I said, according to most Maraja, it causes permanent damage, or it causes death, God forbid, or it causes the loss of limb, which in many cases it doesn't anyway. It's not a, a huge concern for us. Inshallah. May Allah make us... Was there another question from someone over there? Yes, sir. Maybe the last question? Yes, Inshallah. Uh, uh, in regards to what happened uh, to Fatima Zahra um, when you know the, the certain uh, companion um, struck, struck her, um, what, why exactly do you like? What's your view on why Imam Ali didn't um, react, or like, if he was even in the um, home at the time? Because you know a lot of um, people explain that he was, you know. Um, like she didn't want him to see what happened, or he was trying to save the future of the Ummah. But, like, you know, we all know Imam Ali was like, uh, very peaceful and humble, and, you know, um, but and when it came, to, when push came to shove, he was Asadullah, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really grasp the fact of how his wife was going like, gonna to get beat in his own home, and, and like, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't able to do something. So, please. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I love al -Amin the author of the famous uh, encyclopedic work about al ghadiyya uh, with the same title, says in one of his lectures uh, that, obviously this is a man who, who has researched, he says that I skimmed through no less than 100,000 books to write my book. It's a 10 volume encyclopedic work about al ghadiyya the event of Ghadir. So he's, he, he, he knows everything, right? He's read a lot of books. He says that I did not see the courage of Ali in Khaybar, or in Khunayn, or in Badr, or in Ahzab. I saw the courage of Ali in, in seeing his wife being slapped across the face and not reacting. Courage, let me tell you something, for someone who is brave and strong and powerful and muscular, it's not a big deal for them to react violently, it's a big deal if they don't react violently. In the case of Imam Ali, we have narrations upon narrations which explain the fact that the Prophet had told the Imam not to react. Why? Because they wanted the Imam dead. They wanted to kill him. Imam Ali represents, represented the only real opposition to, to what they were planning to do. Imam Ali was the only legitimate heir to the Prophet. And now, they've decided that they want to take over the government. The only person they need to eliminate, really, the only real threat, is Ali ibn Abi Talib. So why would Fatima to Zahra go to the door? Because Fatima to Zahra is appealing to the fact that she is the only uh, uh, remaining family member of the Prophet. She's his blood and flesh. She's his own daughter. And the Prophet has 
barely been buried. You know, it's, it, according to some narrations, it was 30 days after the Prophet's death that she died. But the actual ambush took place either on the same day or the next day. So Fatima Zuzaha is appealing to the fact that, listen, you claim to be followers of this messenger. I'm his daughter. I'm his daughter. Which is why traditions say the, the mastermind of the attack, of the ambush, writes a letter to Muawiyah. In that letter, he reveals a great deal about his intentions, what actually happened. A lot of the details of the ambush are recorded in this letter. You can look it up online. So he writes this letter, and one of the things he says is, when she came behind the door, and she came out and said, what do you want? I told her, he says, what has brought you out? Where is Ali? So this question, you're not the first person to think about this, or any, any, anyone here. He thought at first, he thought, where is Ali? We're here to get Ali. And yet his wife is the one coming to the door. She says to him, uh, he says to her, Ma akhrajaki? What brought you out of your home? She says, Tuhiyanu kayafulam. And she mentions her, his name. She says, it's your oppression and your excessive oppression that has brought me out. In other words, the only deterrent is the, the Prophet's own daughter to come out. Because think about it. He may not believe in the Prophet's Prophethood, but other Muslims did. And so she wanted to fulfill God's proof in saying that I am the, the flesh of their Prophet and look at how he dealt with me. Number one. Number two is to why Imam Ali didn't come out. Imam Ali would have been killed. Listen, let me tell you something. Had Imam Ali reacted in a violent, violent fashion, had he pulled out his sword, which would have been a lot easier for him to do, as you acknowledge, I'm sure, than you know, sitting quietly inside the house. It's very easy. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the one who plucked open the gates to Khaybar. He doesn't, he doesn't need any kind of provocation. And he's not afraid of them, for sure. But had Imam Ali shown any kind of reaction, he would have been outnumbered a hundred to one. There were over 2,000 people, historians say, that ambushed the house of Fatima to Zahar. You think Ali ibn Abi Talib would have been able to, to defeat all of them, to kill each and every one of them? No, and the proof of that is Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein is not, not less courageous than Imam Ali, he's not less powerful than Imam Ali, and yet he was outnumbered and he was killed. They would have killed Imam Ali, and Fatima, and Hassan, and Hussein, and that would have been the end of Islam as we know it. The fact that Fatima to Zahra went meant that they couldn't kill everyone, they couldn't obliterate the entire household. All they could do was crush Fatima to Zahra, between the wall and the door. And immediately after that, historians actually say, to, to put your heart uh, at, at rest, I think, at ease, Imam Ali did come out after Fatima to Zahra fell. He came out and he sat on the chest of the mastermind, the ringleader who attacked the, the house of Fatima to Zahra, and he pulled out his sword and said to him, had it not been for the Prophet telling me to be patient, I would have killed you. So he said to him, then be patient. Realized that Imam Ali was, was his hands were tied. He realized that Imam Ali couldn't react, and that's why they took advantage of the situation. They attacked, and you know, at the end of the day, the Ahlul Bayt are human beings. They're not celestial, you know, ethereal creatures. They're human beings. They're subject to pain. They're subject to to uh, to thirst, to hunger, and even death. And so, in this case, Imam Ali tries to intervene, but not in a violent fashion, without actually killing anyone. But he's immediately apprehended. And only a, a few minutes after that, in my view, Fatima to Zahra regains consciousness after falling unconscious, after experiencing this, this brute force being crushed between the wall and the door. She wakes up and she notices that Imam Ali is being dragged to the mosque with, with his hands and his feet tied. And she screams out and, and says that I'm going to pray to God to, to, to bring his wrath upon this nation unless you leave him alone, and, and, and the rest is history, as they say. But the fact that Imam Ali would not fight was because he was instructed not to fight. Had he actually engaged with them physically, he would have been outnumbered and killed. And imagine, imagine if Imam Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Fatima would have been killed on that day. Would we have Salah? Would we have Hajj? Would we have Siyam? Would we have any trace of humanity in this world? Wallahi, we wouldn't. Wallahi, we wouldn't. Yazid! ended up becoming the successor of the Prophet, even though Imam Ali was there, and Imam Hassan was there, and Imam Hussein was there, and they tried to change things, but they couldn't. 
Inshallah, I hope that answers your question. And at the end of the day, let me just wrap up with this. We have many, many narrations um, uh, that uh, point to uh, the events, the very tragic and unspeakable events that uh, took place after the Prophet's death, um, including uh, one narration in which, uh, I mean, I, I think ultimately, to say that Fatima al-Zahra died a natural death has no merit of any kind, given many, many different uh, factors, including the fact that she was only 18 years old. A healthy 18-year-old girl who, I said this before, uh, the Prophet, one of the reasons we know he was martyred and he was murdered is because he led a very, very healthy lifestyle. In fact, the single healthiest lifestyle was led by the Ahlul Bayt no overeating of any kind, no eating of harmful foods, yes? And so why would they die so early? Why would the Prophet die at the age of 63, having that perfect healthy lifestyle that he led? He died because they, he was poisoned and he was killed. Fatima to Zahra is exactly the same. She was only 18 years old, why would she die? Plus all the narrations that we have from the other day, suggesting that Fatima to Zahra was in fact killed, which is why she was buried at night, which is why we do not know the location Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.